I was about seven or eight at that time, and I'll never forget there was a young kid that was a little bit older than me, and we were at a marketplace, and he had come up to my parents and I, and he was asking for some extra funds to make it to a hospital um, with his mother. Wow. But the thing that was really significant was that he, you know, was definitely dressed um, and probably the only thing that he had. You know, he looked like me. He looked like I could easily have done the same thing if I was in his position. I remember asking my dad, you know, what was it exactly, you know, why can't he get the care that I could at my pediatrician, for example, right? So it started stemming a lot of questions about how things look different in different places in the world. That's kind of how it catapulted me to look more into how I could be a part of the bigger uh, picture for other people. In this episode, we're going to chat with Dr. Mo. We're going to talk about her past specifically also walk with a doc and how she got involved and what it took for her to become a medical doctor in Dallas let's go with dr. Mo let's get right into okay, it yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. How's your day going? How's your week going? Good, yeah, good, yeah. 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 yeah, not too shabby. Mm -hmm. I always love my Fridays because I can kind of reset a yeah. bit and get to do things like this. Ah, that's awesome. awesome. Thanks, for yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Middle of the day. It's pretty sweet. No yeah. problem. Thanks yeah. for having me. So, Dr. Mo, just tell us about yourself in general. Yeah. Um, what got you into medicine? Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm from Dallas and I initially got into, I mean, I would say medicine when I was seven or eight years old. I've uh, always wanted to be a doctor. So that typical kind of saying yeah. of, how did you know? I don't know. I think my wow. pediatrician really impacted me a lot when I was growing up. And seeing a female physician mm -hmm. in particular, I think yeah. was really impactful. But my family, we would travel a lot, doing mm. lots of family vacations. And one particular vacation, we went to Jamaica and, you know, got to see all the sides, yeah. you know, Bob Marley. Hey. It was great. Um, but I was about seven or eight at that time. And I'll never forget there was a young kid that was a little bit older than me. Mm. And we were at a marketplace and he had come up to my parents and I and he was asking for some extra funds mm. to make it to a hospital um, with his mother. Wow. But the thing that was really significant was that that he you know, was definitely dressed um, and probably the only thing that he had. You mm. could tell that he was just trying his best to try to make a way for him and his mom barefoot in these streets that were mm. definitely unpaved. And you know, he looked like me. He looked like I could easily have done the same thing if I wow. was in his position. So I had a lot of questions after that. Wow. And I remember asking my dad, you know, what was it exactly, you know, why can't he get the care that I could at my pediatrician, for example, yeah. right? So it started stemming a lot of questions about how things look different in different mm. places in the world. And that's kind of how it catapulted me to wow. look more into how I could be a part of the bigger uh, picture for other people. Wow. And so, yeah, I just, you know, science was my main yeah, was thing. thing. Yep. yep. And, you know, in high school, just, you know, did all kinds of programs in the summer. Cool. Had like a Texas Women's University camp I went to when I was Sweet. like in middle school. Yeah, it was a forensics camp though. But so <laughs> I, I did, yeah. Yeah, it was a forensics camp. We had to do all kinds of stuff like uh, cadavers. No, no cadavers. Okay, like, oh, we, were, <laughs> we were too young for that. But we were like uh, looking at different cases, you know, back in the day with the John Benet Ramsey mm. case, and so just different things. And it was really good to kind of think outside the box. So even though I was envisioning, of course, in the future, I want to work with patients, right, kind of like right. my pediatrician. Right, right. It was really neat to have those type of experiences too. And I eventually had to have those experiences in medical wow. school. So, so yeah, and it kind of got me to where I am today when I think back at that initial experience in Jamaica and then looking where I've come mm. from in terms of my medical journey, yeah. being abroad and doing work abroad. It, it's really interesting how full circle it is. Wow, yeah. wow. and that's kind of, that really catapulted you through everything. Mm -hmm. It wow. did, yeah. Well, you remember those long nights studying, like the, the oh, residency, yeah. all that? Oh, uh. goodness, yes, yes. Or those calls, like I still cringe when I hear a beeper go off. <laughs> you know, I don't even know if most people know what a beeper <laughs> is. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> or they have but like the cell phone that like sounds like a beeper, yes. the, the ringtone or is it? <sighs> I'm telling you, it's just not good. Man. But but those experiences at the same time, I'm like, I did that though. Yeah, and yeah. undergoing like those types of challenges, I think we kind of get lost in sometimes the day to day, but when we recognize the why behind why we're doing what yeah. we're doing.
we're doing, 100%. it makes it all worth it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So wow. I do remember those nights though. Oh my God. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so, so going from graduating um, medical school, what was that yeah. next step? How did you know where you wanted to practice? Because there's so mm. many different things you could mm -hmm. do. Yeah. What kind of guided you to where you are right now? That's a good question. So, I mean, graduating, I feel like, you know, you're, the ball's in your court, right? Yeah, true, and so true. having those mentorships was really important to me. I knew that at the end of the day, because of the way that I trained, I really wanted to be able to be involved in the community in some nice. way. So I was fortunate to have a lot of those mentors to kind of guide me along nice. the way. But until I could really like sink my feet into a role, I did some urgent care work. Okay, so yeah, yeah. working at you know some clinics here and there, and that was a, an experience in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, being able to triage a person, see you know the acute need, and make an instantaneous decision. Yeah, yeah. You can't you know you can't like really learn that yeah. unless you're in it, and if you're in it every single day. But it wasn't for me, yeah. and I decided you know I do want to try to find something that I can get to know a patient and hopefully their entire family cool. in a different type of setting so that's why I think when I came across like various clinics I've worked at mm. it ended up being a better fit mm. at the end of the day mm. so family medicine because you're seeing more of from infancy all the way to yeah. you know geriatric age or elderly population you have to know a little about everything yeah, yeah. and so you know, urgent care comes in the mix of that yes, too. Yeah. So being able to see, okay, this person really should probably go to the hospital versus feeling confident that I think I can really treat this myself gotcha. and avoid a hospitalization. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I think that it led in terms of me being able to have those experiences to where I am now, which is more focused on geriatric care. Mm. I never really envisioned I'm going to be working in this population yeah, for yeah. as long as I have so yeah. far. Um, but I think it kind of reflects back to my grandparents yeah. I grew up with my grandparents cool. and seeing them go to the doctor and just you know recognizing certain things about the way they interacted with their mm. physician also instilled qualities yeah. within my own self yeah. um, for example even my grandmother she has an oncologist that she had been with for gosh I think almost 20 years wow. and that oncologist treated actually my grandfather before he passed away wow but what's really insane is that full circle now he has seen me grow up and you know since I was a kid wow. and it's funny because the way that he approached healthcare and the way that he respected and mm -hmm. valued my grandparents really stuck with me I was always like you know what I want to be like them That's you know cool. and so I think those types of experiences it's little by little but it does shape who you are it does, yeah, yeah yeah it's like it's like the the experiences that you've seen from just the life in general really mm -hmm. pulls you to be the best doctor that you could yeah, be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What? So if if you had someone who was just like basically coming out of med medical school mm -hmm. and looking about going into family medicine mm -hmm. just in general. Yeah. You know, the books teach you certain things. Yeah. But what would you just if you had any advice for someone like what were some things that you have learned mm -hmm. that can really help them? do a good job just just curious I would say you know it's always good number one you want to go into it for mm. the right reasons yeah. um, I feel like sometimes there may be hidden pressures I've heard from other friends and you know colleagues that they may not have had that intentionality in the beginning yeah. but then came to fall in love with it which yeah. is great yeah. that's a that's a positive outcome yeah. but then you may have the other outcome where if they do happen to get more forced or pressured for societal purposes True. families True. you know anything then they're not going to have as much empathy for the patients they treat and then that will also dictate how patients do and the yeah. out you know their outcomes so I would say make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and find your why so mm. why do you want to be a physician what makes you so passionate about the mm. work of what we do day to day mm. and try to work alongside a physician mm. and be authentic and yeah, like yeah, what you yeah. want to see because if you want to see everything you can but you have to be open to the reception that not everything is you know rainbows and sunshine right, right, and that's right, okay right. that's within anything you yeah, do yeah. but it is important to really see what it means to truly be a physician it's not mm. just wearing a white coat yeah. it's not just walking in and writing a prescription it's more getting to know very authentically and genuinely yeah. what the needs of this individual are and how you can collaborate with them on trying to make their lives better and so I think that that's really important for 
our generation and those that go on after us to know yeah. intentionality is important. Yeah. And so being able to go into it with that mind is yeah. important. And there are gonna be challenges. Oh I mean, gosh, I, yeah. I mean, I did not do great on the MCAT yeah, the first yeah. go around. Um, and so, you know, you have to keep going. And yeah. I tried again yeah. and knew that at the end of the day, this is what I'm set to do. Um, surrounding yourself with good people that can yeah. encourage you and your dreams is yeah. also very important. That's, that's massive. Yeah. I think like, the biggest thing is, you know, we serve seniors, right? And right. so like that, the next generation of mm -hmm. doctors, of healthcare practitioners mm -hmm. is, is massive. Yeah. And yeah. they've got, I like what you mm -hmm. said, they've got to have that heart. Yeah. They've got to have the desire because it's a, it's a need. It is. And it's going to tax you. Oh <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it is. Gonna, and yeah. you have to find a way to fill your cup again. And because I think that's sometimes where you have that burnout and physicians may get yeah. deterred to just quit. Yeah. Um, and you have to just kind of go back, like yeah. I said, to that why. It's not about the accolades. It's yeah. not about, like I said, the superficial things. You have to really want to Focus help people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about how do you fill your cup? How's, yeah. So how do you like refresh, you know, mm -hmm. in the midst of a crazy work week or sure. as, a, as a doctor? Just yeah. Some tips. Um, exercise is great, mm. so oh, definitely. Let's talk about walk with the doctor a yeah, little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah, a good yeah, transition. Yeah. Um, but I think you know, we, me and my husband, actually have a personal trainer. Nice. So shout out to our personal trainer. Hey, yeah. Hey, so hey. we do try to work out a few times a week and good, then get good. some walking in. Um, I walk with the doc is a great, you know, mm. kind of caveat, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, ahead, to yeah. that. Um, so with walk with the doc, it is a program that I've been a part of now for the last five and a half years, and so once a month. Mm -hmm. I actually will host a walk at White Rock Lake and yeah, anybody is welcome. We'll talk about a health topic wow. and then we'll walk a little bit. And I think it's great to be in community with other people sure, that are yeah. also trying to better themselves. So sometimes we get kind of stuck of in the four walls of a clinic. That's the only way you can see your physician. So this is an opportunity outside of the four walls wow. to be able to break down any kind of, you know, uh, barriers so that patients can speak to you, you know, very, you know, transparently about yeah. the struggles that they're going through. Yeah. Also, family, friends, they yeah. can ask questions, things that they're dealing with or don't know how to quite approach with their own pri you know, primary care provider. And it just opens up a lot of opportunities. Wow. So I love it. Um, there's ways in which people can get involved, whether you're a medical student, uh, physical therapy students wow. do it too. It's also international now. There's various countries that really? are now taking on Walk With The Doc. It's pretty cool. And so I wow. really love doing it. It takes like a little bit of a break from my normal day yeah, to day. Yeah. And now I'm implementing it more even on a more local level where my clinic is located to try to get our seniors more active mm. and kind of accommodate their needs instead of maybe walking outside because we know this Texas heat is, oh, you know, yeah. very we difficult. We were just talking about that. <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, doing it at a rec center, doing mm. it at a local gym, yeah. things like that, that other people can get involved uh, that may have various wow. levels of abilities. Wow. So, yeah, it's a wow. great program. It's amazing. How did you get involved with like walking on the dock or walk? Walk a doc, sorry. Uh -huh. walk, walk with the doc. Walk uh -huh. with the doc. Walk. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I was actually told about it through, I'm a part of a few different organized medicine groups. Mm -hmm. One is called the Texas Academy of Family Physicians. And so I was a part of a program that we, I guess as a part of the culmination of the program had to do a project and what we wanted to do to give back to the community. And so Walk With The Doc was something that I heard like a buzz about. Mm. And I said, huh, let me learn more. And that's when I started. So it was kind of a project that I took on to see how it would work in my community. And then it just catapulted. And I said, well, I'm just gonna continue it. And now I've done it for five and a half years. Yeah. So it's really fun. It definitely breaks up some of the, you know, day to day as I mentioned and it gives back to the community in many ways mm -hmm. and I feel like patients are more apt to attend mm -hmm. because they know okay there are going to be other people there that may have same questions as yeah. I do or yeah. different questions and yeah it just breaks down those walls like I said that's cool yeah that's cool hey if you haven't already make sure you like and subscribe the YouTube algorithm told us what they tell us it told us it was like 99% of our people watching these videos are not subscribed so that means you you need to subscribe and hope you continue to enjoy our content. All right, bye. That's cool. So let's circle back to you as a, as a doctor, right? As in terms of family medicine. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you serve more uh, seniors, right? Or geriatric populations kind of right. mostly. So 
let's walk behind the scenes of what mm -hmm. you do in a day. Like I know sure. you see patients and sometimes patients know Dr. Mo, mm -hmm. right? But what does your day-to-day -day look like? What do your rhythms look like when yeah. you're in the clinic or sure. at the office? Just curious. So usually my day starts off with a pre-preparation. So okay. I'll know the patients that are coming into the office. I'll look with my team, which consists of a medical assistant. And I actually have the opportunity and privilege of having a scribe. Oh, nice. So a medical scribe also is a huge win in many ways because you have that ability to teach the scribe kind of what you're looking for in terms of a note, what to include what are kind of your diagnostic approaches. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our scribes tend to go on to various roles within medicine. So that's kind of a nice teaching yeah. opportunity. Um, once we kind of gather together as a group, we'll discuss what we want to achieve out of every visit. And sometimes what we may think will happen doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah. sometimes we may have you know, a patient that comes in and unfortunately they had a loved one pass away and that's the focus of the visit. Yeah. We're not gonna change anything else around to try to meet any kind of metric. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, patients are seen as people. Mm. Some people like I feel like can feel as if a clinic is more of churn and burn let's mm. just get them in and out but what I love about the dynamics of the way we approach medicine and our clinic is that it is very holistic and seeing the patient as you know they're coming as they are and what can we do to help them get through so we have a plan but it doesn't sometimes go right, according to plan right, right. Um, but I think that pre prep is very important and it sets us up for success for the day mm. so what vaccines do we have what vaccines do we not have are there medical equipment items that we actually have in center that we mm. could give to this patient what are the dme needs mm. right um home health uh, mm. are there things that we need to be thinking long term about this yeah, patient yeah. so all those conversations go on for about 40 minutes at the mm. beginning of the day and then off to the races and we're seeing patients now in between that time i may be called upon to you know do a medication um, reconciliation okay. or look over yeah. medications to send in for a patient to a pharmacy yeah. um, there may be other kind of different tasks so you're balancing a lot yeah. but I think at the end of the day you know what we always like to do is just go back to the fact that okay we're trying to set up a patient yeah. so that by the time they leave the clinic they're not leaving more confused but they're leaving more empowered so sometimes you know you have to just make sure like you have a lot of things on your agenda but at the end of the day even if you don't get through all those things yeah. you're trying to make sure that 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 particular goal is set someone's yeah. leaving feeling more confident in what they have going on with their wow. health. Um, so yeah, so as I go through my patients, uh, kind of wrapping up through the end of the day, I may have additional type of administrative tasks that mm. I have to do. Um, but at the end, that's pretty much it. I yeah. try not to take any work home. Sweet. And it's very difficult yeah. to do that, yeah. but is, that yeah. balance is important. Yeah, that's so true. That's yeah. True. Wow. When you see a patient, you know, during that day, yeah. how often in a year, just how, do, how frequently do you see a patient, if you were to say like, um, Miss Betty question. comes to see you. Yeah. Normal, right? Just a normal, you mm -hmm. know, normal needs. Sure. How frequently do you see them in a given year? Yeah. In a given year. So I would say at least on a minimum amount four times a year. Cool. That's minimum. Um, we have, you know, different systems of how we, you know, do the cadence of our visits. Nice. So there may be a patient that has a lot of needs. And so we're gonna see them every three weeks. Cool. Maybe even sooner than that, depending on what's going on. Wow. Um, because I also happen to see more Spanish speakers, yeah. there may be also more time allotted for me to be able to take time to do medication reconciliations, make sure that they understand the medicines that they're taking. Wow. I think sometimes because in other clinical settings there's shorter visits, you miss a lot. Mm. And so we try our best. We can't do it all, but True. we can do yeah. better than the last time, yeah, right? Yeah. And so there are some things that we'll note on the chart like, I don't know if this particular patient, for example, is completely literate. Mm. Or I don't know if this person may understand the different medicines they're taking and the why behind mm. it. So I always try to make sure that patients feel empowered of why they're taking certain medicines. If they have questions about yeah. it, to be open with me That's about good. why um, they may be hesitant about taking something. Because a lot of times, if you just don't ask, you're not going to know. Yeah. I always tell True. patients, I don't know what I don't know. So if you don't tell me, 
I, I don't know. I, I yeah. Don't know. So, uh, but yeah, I think that usually the cadence is like minimum every three months, as early as every three weeks, that's cool. and so in between that, one to two months. Wow. So yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you do as a doctor to kind of keep those rhythms in between? So in between those four times a year, how do you? check up on them, what are, sure. what are some things that doctors do? So within our practice, we have so many people that are mm. hands-on. So we have people that happen to look at statistically mm. kind of the cadence of patients coming in. Um, there's also ways in our EMR that mm. we're able to see, okay, this person hasn't come in for X amount of months, let's make sure to flag them so that they can come back in. Gotcha. We have community health workers, we oh, have wow. a social worker. And so those types of individuals that are so good at what they do they're instrumental in being able to keep patients yeah. in and our outreach team too right mm. so we have our outreach individuals so they will also have kind of their own lists of patients so mm -hmm. to speak mm -hmm. to be able to keep up let's say with dr. Mo's panel and what's going on there um, so we are able to meet that need in those ways where it's not all on the provider That's it's awesome. kind of it's distributed among yeah. yeah amongst the team That's exactly really cool. yeah wow, wow, wow so let's walk through just normal diagnoses that you see yeah. a lot you know sure. so i know a lot of times when someone talks about hypertension it's mm -hmm. like oh right? right or just you know diabetes mm -hmm. what are some things that you see uh, common uh -huh. and then what are some things that you can kind of advise patients when they look at these things, sure. they see these things. So I would say for hypertension, so I always break it down, like what does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. So blood pressure, okay, we can kind of break it down with that. Um, a lot of people don't realize how silent blood pressure is. Mm -hmm. Some people feel like it has to be only symptoms. So I have to have a headache or I have to have yeah. chest pain and kind of those more alarming symptoms when you don't have to have any of that to have high blood pressure. So I always educate first about, okay, what's your family history look mm -hmm. like? Have you been told you've had high blood pressure before we'll talk about symptoms too but also looking at their diet and trying to kind of go back to basics with that mm -hmm. a lot of people again they're just not aware that mm -hmm. certain things that they may be doing day to day are detrimental to their health yeah. so I don't assume I don't assume that they're just intentionally doing certain mm. things you have to ask and also knowing where they live what their access yeah. is and are they even able to afford certain medications yeah. because they may have been prescribed medicines in the past let's say by another provider but they didn't take them not because they were you know intentionally trying to be non-compliant but they just didn't know why they were even taking yeah. it in the beginning so I always bring up diagrams and photos. I'm a very visual person, yeah, yeah. so I'll always uh, you know, bring up a picture of a heart, for example, or when I'm talking about something like peripheral vascular disease, which is related to high hypertension, mm -hmm. I'll show them, like, this is what's going on with the circulation and the blood mm. flow. Um, I use kind of different descriptors or analogies, like a water hose, like, okay, you're watering your yard, yep. and you know how water's going through? Well, what if Mr. Charles wasn't so yep. nice and yep. was behind me and kinked the kinked hose? It, yep. That That's not good blood flow yep, yep. and so that can happen in the heart so I feel that we have to kind of get back to the basics I'll explain to them what that means mm. hypertension really can mean different things for different people with different conditions so um, your goal blood pressure is going to look a lot different for someone that has diabetes True. and same thing for anyone let's say with chronic kidney disease yeah. and your age matters too there's different thresholds yeah. so I try not to get so nitty-gritty until like we start getting into issues where it comes to control so yeah. that they know and they feel empowered when I go home and I check my blood pressure I know if it's more than 140 on that mm. top number that dr. Muhammad said and if it's more than let's say a hundred on that bottom number I need to call her yeah. you know so I try to empower them of the why behind that use those descriptors like diagrams yeah. so that they can better understand yeah. and then when it comes to I feel like the food and making sure that they're eating properly yeah. I usually will give with the help of my medical assistant and scribe information for example like a grocery list mm. this is a good diabetic grocery list yeah. this is a good anti-hypertension yes. that you know list for example to go off of but also understanding what grocery stores are nearby um, are you in a food desert yeah. based off of your zip code um, are you running out of food at the end of the month and so that's when we can kind of tag on that's some amazing. of our other 
you know, folks yeah. within the clinic. So whether it's a social worker, community health worker, or even me, now that I'm out in the community more to be able to say, hey, there's a food pantry near yeah, you. There's an Aldi's right there. Yeah. Yeah, 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 stuff like that, I think goes leaps and bounds where patients feel more comfortable sharing with you. Cause I think sometimes they'll go in thinking, are you gonna get mad at me? You know, we're kind of seen yeah. as like such such a big, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we're gonna reprimand yeah, them. They got like a ruler in your back pocket. Yes, like <laughs> exactly. And I'm wow. like, no, I'm no. not here. I'm here to help yeah. you. I want to be seen as kind of your partner in crime, not yeah. someone that's going to like lock you up, you yeah. know? And so I think that kind of disarms things a bit more. And then they're honest. And when we check that blood sugar, that A1C yep. every three months, which we do to check the that's blood good. sugar, yeah. um, if it's higher than normal, usually before it even comes yeah. back, the results, someone will tell me, you know, yeah. I ate a lot of cookies this weekend or, you know, over the last few months yeah. or, you know, holidays and I know I'm going to get better. And then they'll feel empowered to set their own goals. That's they're not good. achieving it for me. They're yeah. achieving it for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think those type of tools are really helpful. I like visuals. I like patients leaving with items that they feel like they are empowered to use so that when they do come back, they can tell me what they've done. The, yeah. yeah. So let's, let, you said a hemoglobin A1C. Yeah. Let's see if some, let someone doesn't even know what that is. Yes. Well, what yes. is that? Yeah, so <laughs> it's, okay, that's a great example. Yeah. So our blood cells, our red mm -hmm. blood cells will carry on glucose and that is an average. The A1C is a measure of those red blood cells. On a three month or so average, how much glucose is attached to those red blood cells? Mm -hmm. And so an A1C, we usually will hope no one meets a threshold where it goes into a diabetic range. So an A1C of 5.7 or below is actually, um, you know, what we would say is a normal blood sugar, but 5.7 and above, mm -hmm. like to about 6.4, is what we call borderline diabetes. Anything above 6.4 is what we would say, like 6.5 mm -hmm. or higher, is diabetic. So we do want to measure that every three months because it gives a good indication as to someone's eating habits and what they're kind of doing in those three months wow. to help achieve those goals. Um, but that being said, A1C is not perfect yeah, and okay. so mm -hmm. there are certain things that we have to keep in mind like someone that may be a dialysis patient their blood sugar may be a little bit altered not a, you know a significant amount right. but it's not an exact science yeah, like with yeah. that uh, because of their medical conditions um, so yeah it is a really great tool to use but I always tell patients because they think that what they've done that day or the day oh, before yeah, is yeah. an indication as their a1c and I'm like oh but no <laughs> that's actually three months, three months. Three months in the yeah. work <laughs> Yeah, three months. Wow. So, but yeah, that's what A1C is. It's a great monitor of you know how someone's doing. And mm. when we talk about our elderly kind of geriatric yeah. age patients, we also don't want to be insanely aggressive because we may have targets for those that are under, let's say, 64. Usually, an A1C below eight will help achieve a lot of goals like uh, better vision, uh, mm. less you know neuropathy, which is like tingling sensation yeah. in the fingers and the toes and stuff. Um, overall, better health with the kidneys so all those things it's like a benefit if someone can drop their a1c half a point or even a point all those things are so much you know i guess like meaningful if you're mm. explaining to patients that because you've achieved x y and z you're minimizing your risk of a heart attack you know ai uh, disease yeah. all these different things so it's a big win mm. um so yeah that's a really good i guess talking point a lot for like patients a good start, a almost, start. Like, almost like a baseline or is it yeah a yeah. baseline I've actually diagnosed patients, them not knowing at all, uh, where they've just been having symptoms of, let's say, increased urination, um, lethargy, mm. dry mouth, and just feeling fatigued. And, you know, family history may be possible mm. that di they have been diabetics and when I check the A1C it's full-blown diabetes and wow. there's of course kind of that deep breath in the room but also a sigh of relief because they don't do. they didn't know and yeah. so now we can have a means of detecting you know further things that could go wrong if we don't yeah. go ahead and address the diabetes but also making sure that it doesn't progress to something yeah. way worse yeah. so wow, that's yeah that's good I know that's that's so important. I think that's it's good because I think a lot of times people just need to know where to, where to start. Kinda yeah. Sometimes like sure. Do I focus on this or like yeah. talk to their doc about this? Yes. So that's, that's yes. really good. Yeah. yeah. Screening is important. So family medicine we're always seen as the screeners and preventers. So that's why it's so important to 
have a family physician mm. because we're able to see based off of your age, based mm. off of your family history, risk factors, and of course having blood work to yeah. complement that. But we're able to see what could be yeah. and try our best to prevent those things from happening. I've had patients, for example, say, oh, but I don't want a mammogram. Mm. And I'm like, well, well, why? You know, mm -hmm. asking them why, listening to them. What is it about having X, Y, and Z tests right. done that you're afraid of? And then you end up uncovering, oh, well, it was not a comfort and it wasn't a comfortable test. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I was afraid because I may have cancer because my mom or dad yeah. or, or my mom or you know family member yeah. you know ended up having cancer. So finding out the why behind it is also important. And then we're able to prevent so much from happening. Um, I always tell people we're not God, okay? Yeah, like the yeah, God yeah. complex, like yeah. no, we're learning too. Yeah. Um, so I think again, that disarming mentality is so yeah. important. Yeah. And I love the fact that I think the biggest thing is the time to, to mm -hmm. take with the patient. I yeah. think a lot of times, you know, in, in healthcare, just sometimes the way it is you know, with sure. doctors, sometimes you don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. But like the fact that you're able to yeah. take time, teach, walk yes. the patient through these mm -hmm. are the signs and symptoms these are the treatment plan right. i think it helps overall with outcomes would you say it, as well it, it does and i'm a big proponent of repeating so mm. i want the patient before they leave you tell me what i said yeah How, what did you hear yeah, yeah. because sometimes quiz them they at the end. yeah quiz them at the end like okay Flash so you're cards, taking no this <laughs> yes yes and i always have them bring their medicines every That's visit cool. not just like once every couple months but getting them in the habit mm -hmm. um, because you end up finding out things like oh oh wait, you ended up getting two refills from the pharmacy, but you're actually taking both medicines. Wow. So that's why your blood pressure is low and you're not feeling so great. Something really small. Can have a big, yeah. big, big issue yeah. <laughs> down the road. It, yeah. yeah, certainly. Wow. So yes, I think that teach back method is super important. And just, you know, being able to have that time, as you mm. mentioned, is very critical. Mm. Um, a lot of the former practices that I was in, we didn't have that. And so for me personally, I didn't feel like I was doing as good of a job being wow. a clinician because I had to kind of get in and out, yeah. but I still took as much time as I possibly could. Yeah. But you could tell that it just a little bit more time would go that extra mile for that patient. Yeah. So it is very, very meaningful. It helps prevent hospitalizations 100%. as well and having family members join too i think that's important yeah. i always try to you know try to have like a um, family member come in for a visit if they can just so that that is also someone's counterpart to be able to reinforce what maybe i've said during a visit yeah. in case the individual yeah, may keep forget them accountable so, hey dr mo said this yeah <laughs> you remember that you right like, <laughs> like, oh. yes yeah that helps exactly. them actually get better yeah mm -hmm. well, that's cool yeah so now we talked about hypertension Talked about a little bit about diabetes. Uh -huh. uh, what are some other common uh, diagnoses? You talk about meat depression. What are some other things that you see, and how do you? help patients go through that? Sure. No, depression, I think, depression, anxiety, yeah. dementia, um, I think all of those are very uh, critical and important no matter who you're talking about. Um, I think sometimes it can be very much overlooked. Mm. And so I think it's important that the whole clinical team feels comfortable with talking about yeah. it because oftentimes it may be a medical assistant that's screening for yeah. these things and they actually end up finding out and they may not know how to bring it up to the provider, but also they may they may screen fine and yeah. actually seem like okay, no, no depression, no anxiety, it, it zeros on everything, on everything, <laughs> and then you go in Flat and well, yeah you know wow. something's going on. Um, so I do feel that that's also really important. Um, I think being able to encourage patients to be able to express themselves and what they're going through because there's seasons in life. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for them to be able to come to you no matter what and have that trust to be able to say, you know what, I'm not feeling that great and this is why. Yeah. Or I. Okay, I may need help because things can still be so stigmatized in various settings and yeah. various cultures and even amongst family yeah. that they may not feel that it's okay to talk about these things. But if they feel safe to talk about it with you, 
you've really won. Good. That's power to be able to help that person. Wow. And so, yes, I feel like the whole clinical team being able to be very informed about certain things, what they look like. Um, I would say for depression and anxiety, what we definitely do is if someone does happen to screen high or they don't, we will make sure that they get tagged up with a behavioral health specialist. That's cool. And also connecting somewhere within the community, pending their resources with insurance and things like that, but with extra counseling and behavioral therapy. That's and really I think right. that that's really important. And sometimes when it comes to things like you know, high blood pressure, or we're talking about diabetes, those conditions that are sometimes overlooked can actually mm. improve yes. those other conditions, That's true. right? That's true, yeah. Because stress, yeah. um, anxiety, can't you know, think you can't think straight. Can't follow, like, you can't yeah. follow the plan of care that you may have. Right. So, you know, we can be focused in on compliance and why, 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 but if the person's wow. depressed, uh, if they can't think straight, you're just going to be in a cycle, right? Wow. Um, dementia is also a big one, I will say. I think that's why I always will try in my practice to bring a family member yeah. into a visit and also making sure things like um, advanced care planning, medical power of attorney, mm. those items are done within the first visit mm. or the first few visits because the trajectory in anyone's life as we get older, there are going to be things that change yeah. with our cognitive abilities. It doesn't mean obviously someone's going to get dementia, but there may be challenges that we're, you're not able to foresee. So to kind of prevent those things mm -hmm. from happening in the future where you're not sure who the person may be within their circle that they trust the most or that they have the most confident in helping them make medical decisions, having those conversations more early on mm -hmm. is very important. Um, so yeah, I think it's very important also to understand someone's background, whether it's their literacy or lack thereof yeah. level, um, education, all those things come into play when we talk about cognition. Mm. And so I am a big proponent of making sure to do those mini cogs. Those are yeah. uh, you know assessments yeah. for your cognition and seeing how patients track throughout the year. Yeah. We may do it once every six months just to yeah. kind of compare notes and see if there's been any changes yeah. going on or talk to the patient themselves and Sometimes they'll bring it to you and say, not only have I forgotten my keys, but yeah, I forgot where my car everything. was and everything. And so we can really try to dig deeper into yeah. that. Yeah. What do, what, do you, what do you advise family members who they have like an uncle or an aunt or even a mom or dad mm -hmm. who's struggling with, you're seeing signs of dementia and mm -hmm. like, what, what do they do when they're kind of like in that place and they're like, not willing to like maybe go to the doctor like what do you what do you what do, sure. you, what do you see so safety is number one mm -hmm. right so i would always try to see if it's possible make sure those individuals are not alone for extended periods of time um, checking on like locks on doors mm -hmm. um, if they feel like there may not there may not be like a safe um, method of them like let's say driving or doing things as independently then that's when you probably should be able mm -hmm. to you know try to find and contact a healthcare provider because that's something you don't want to happen where yeah. you wish you would have gotten help sooner um, but I think destigmatizing it is important uh, for some you know different cultures and members of society they feel that if for any reason an individual is diagnosed with something like cognitive impairment yeah. or dementia then that means their life is over and there's so many layers to a medical diagnosis with that but I always encourage people it's important to have someone like a family doctor that's already in the patient's life yeah. so that those screenings can be done um, and the whole family can be involved yeah. I think it gets scary when you just are not able to have that support and there are groups out there the Alzheimer's Association is yeah. one of the best yeah. groups out there and they have all kinds of support groups they have um, different you know means of like presenting to patients True. and their families different signs and symptoms to look out for and support along yeah. the way and a lot of it's free free yeah. services which is really great for some individuals that may have financial constraints mm, so that's yeah really good. that's really, so, they, so they don't feel like they're alone you yes know, I, I, like, uh -huh. I love that like yeah using utilizing other resources to say like okay you're not alone yeah. in this journey no with mom and dad are on and uncle mm -hmm. that's really good exactly really cool. yeah what you know as we kind of kind of bring it back full circle you know that that impact that you had when you're in Jamaica uh -huh. right? and how mm -hmm. you were able to see you know that mm -hmm. that young boy like how are you now applying like you're now you're a doctor it's mm -hmm. crazy like you know yeah. you're a doctor now how are you applying giving back in the community what are some things that you do 
to kind of be fulfilled as a doctor? I think being able to go into communities Mm. that are so overlooked. Mm. I think during COVID especially, that was unmasked in so many ways where a lot of our underserved population uh, was even more forgotten, but it also created a lens for people to see, oh, what are we not doing, you know? And, but for me, I think it's always been that giving back, like even from early on in my, you know, training in Dominica, Mm. um, through my medical school to even throughout Parkland and UT Southwestern as well, with the training, we're able to really give back to our communities. Um, I think that it helped create a different type of lens that I see medicine through. Mm. So we have the luxury in the United States, right? We can order any test. We can do X, Y, and Z. But if we're not able to do like bare, you know, just physical examinations, basic things, then we've kind of lost our touch. So I'm always trying to better myself, but just going back to the basics and seeing the need. Um, This person may not need a CT scan or a chest x-ray right away, um, but let's see kind of what's going on first, because there may be financial constraints. Insurance is probably not going to cover that. You know, there's all those other extra layers of thinking that I really believe that through my experience of being abroad, really help shape how I approach things. Most pressing need. Yeah, most pressing need. Um, And also how to do without. There may be some things that we just can't do and we have to figure it out. Um, I've had many things like in the past where I like created an ICU from not having much at all, wow. like w- abroad. And the patient did well, you know? Wow. And it's like these things through the help of many other people. But those types of things and being in those challenging situations really push you to be a better doctor yeah. so that you can take things back home, which there are things that are happening happening stateside and yeah. very much domestic um, type of situations that you can do better. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to just write that order yeah. right away um, because you have to see like what that after effect would be for the patient. They may have a $150 bill that they just can't pay. Um, So if it's needed, okay, but it may not be really needed. Mm. So I think that that really has helped shape kind of my approach into my diagnoses and my treatment plan. Um, It's really a good, I think, asset to be able to see how medicine is practiced in other settings, right? Um, And it's challenging. It's definitely challenging, but I think it definitely helps yeah. you know kind of shape you yeah i think it's it's powerful because i think when we really look at the one what, what healthcare was meant for yeah it's meant for care mm-hmm. and i think a lot of times you know just organizations as in general they forget okay if you can't if there's a boundary to, mm-hmm. to, to care for someone mm-hmm. you have to create mm-hmm. the ability to care for them and a lot of times you know that's what a lot of us practitioners, doctors, mm-hmm. therapists, we forget like, well, what's what's it, what's it about? It's about caring right. for the patient. Yeah. And you can create an avenue to mm-hmm. care for them. Right, yeah. right. That's yeah, so you can. Cool. You can. Wow. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, a lot of times when people get so inundated with, you know, just the day to day, they can forget about, oh, wait, there is a person on the other mm. side of this that could be my mom, my dad, yeah. my yeah. spouse, anybody. So it, it's really important. I always tell patients, I'm going to tell you exactly like I would tell someone in my yes. family. And they're like, really? I'm like, yes, really. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I will. And they like that, you yeah. know, they're like, OK, you're you're you, you're making it real yeah. and so uh, yeah that's, that's awesome. what i would say that's awesome. yeah. thanks again for tuning in to watch this episode of charlotte care pods with dr mo there'll be another episode with a q a with dr mo so stay tuned thanks again god bless and we'll see you next time